This is Lee Habib with our American Stories. And now we bring you Doug Ryder with our latest edition of our Founders Series, a series about how everyday Americans risk it all to follow their dreams, how people amidst doubts and challenges become founders of great businesses and great movements. Here's Doug with the story. Today on The Founders. As a baby boomer, this sounds odd, but I thought as a kid growing up that everybody went to war. I always thought there'd be a war you were gonna go to when you got to be of age. So when the Vietnam War came along, I signed up. I didn't even think twice about it. In this episode, we bring you the story of a man whose childhood dreams would become reality. I ended up flunking the first grade. I just didn't do my homework. I was, I kept getting in the way of my, going out and playing, playing army, <laughs> you know, with the fake plastic guns and stuff. And also I had an interest in aviation and would do these soap rock racer things with wings and try to go down these hills and try to fly. I flew for this Sultan of Oman. Yeah, I was a major in the Royal Oman Police Force for 13 years, and I flew the, for the King of Saudi Arabia as an air medical pilot for three years. A man who would use his vast experience to save the lives of people you often don't think about, but one day might need. My mission is to bring down the accident rate in helicopter EMS, air medical. The founder, the person responsible for America's air medical safety movement. On today's episode of The Founders, we bring you the story of Randy Maines. How can we stop the carnage? Following his military service, Randy found some less than mundane jobs around the world, herding cattle with helicopters in Australia, discovering oil and training pilots in Iran. Though after the Iran hostage crisis, Randy's employer had to pull him out, and he was out of a job. Luckily, an old military buddy named Joe threw him a lifeline. And Joe was now flying this new thing called Helicopter Air Medical at Herman Hospital in Houston. And he called me up at the hotel and said, how would you like to have this new job flying uh, this new thing called Helicopter EMS? I said, what's EMS? He said, you're an air ambulance. And, and Herman Hospital is the second program in America. And we're, we're trying to prove to a doubting American public and medical field that the helicopter can be used to save lives in peacetime in America like we knew it could in Vietnam and in Korea. That was in uh, January 79. I said, yeah, I'm out of a job, Joe. That sounds great. So we moved to Houston. And Houston became like a training base because these air ambulance programs were popping up right and left. The medical director saw it as like a, a, a courtesy car bringing high paying trauma patients to their hospital, racking up big bills. So it throws out a broader net. And so it was exciting stuff, but we were working 72 hour shifts, 72 hours at the hospital, and then you had 72 hours off. Little sleep, high stress situations. Seems like a disaster waiting to happen. Normally about 13 people die every year in helicopter air ambulance. The number one main type of accident, they usually try to avoid going into the clouds. They fly single pilot, they don't have another pilot with them. And what happens is they go into the clouds inadvertently in weather with a real dark, environment where they can't see the horizon. They're not proficient in flying on instruments or, or comfortable flying on instruments like a fixed wing pilot. They lose spatial orientation. It, it's a scary situation. They call it inadvertent IMC, going inadvertently into instrument meteorological conditions. They don't know which way up is and they crash. This 
an air medical pilot. You know, we flew 85% of our, our flights to the scene of the accident. I've seen, I've seen more, way, 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 way more blood, gore, and guts and human suffering flying as an air medical pilot than I ever saw in Vietnam. Now, why is that? Well, there's this thing called the golden hour. If you can transport a severely injured patient within an hour of the incident, the chances of survival are exponentially greater. We're talking about an accident so severe that the speed of a helicopter is the difference between life and death. Accidents so severe that the pilots don't have time to assess the weather conditions, use their flying instruments, and mitigate other human error. An old buddy, David Sutcliffe, who at the time worked for the government of Oman, visited Randy in San Diego and stayed with him in his EMS quarters. He saw me keep getting these uh, calls at night, and this is after we got the, rid of the um, instrument helicopter. Now I'm back to flying a helicopter that's just using your eyeballs and staying visual. He couldn't believe that I was taking off in this kind of weather on a single engine helicopter. He said, Randy, if we ever get an opening in Oman, would you like to have a job there? I said, yes, because this is dangerous. This is dangerous. Randy Maines, and he was not the founder of a business, but he was a founder of something even more important, a movement, the air medical safety movement. Randy was at a crossroads. There was the dangerous air ambulance work that he was doing, and there was this job abroad. Well, let's just say it was safer. Let's pick up where we last left off. I already lost, almost lost my life five times. Twice going inadvertently into the clouds and luckily getting myself down again. And this is in a helicopter that's not certified to fly on instruments. This is before the Bell 222. And three other times I almost lost my life. At night, landing to a, um, a road with, to a perfectly set up flare pattern by the first responders with crisscross wires overhead of it. They didn't look up. I could see it was dangerous. So yes, I wanted to get uh, out of it. And true to his word, about seven months later, he offered, I was offered a job flying with the Royal Oman Police in Oman. So I became a major, a uniform major. It was the best job I ever had in my life because we were treated like professionals. We were never questioned on our judgment like we were in air medical back in the States. EMS pilots aren't used to having any judgment on the safety of flying conditions at all. They would usually just get orders, fly out to an accident, and that was it. In fact, the hospital medical directors required pilots to lift off within five minutes of getting their orders. Barely any time at all to assess if the flying conditions would put themselves and the patients at risk. This is crazy. This is an organization, or, or they, these are people that are trying to save lives and they're killing people. To be clear, pilots aren't dying because of medical directors. They're dying for three reasons. One, inadequate instrument training that would otherwise allow pilots to reorient when getting turned upside down in the clouds. Two, pilots don't have proper safeguards to prevent these scenarios, such as GPS, autopilot, and two-engine helicopters stable enough to help mitigate bad weather and human error. And three, they're flying single-engine helicopters with no space for a co-pilot to help guide them out of sticky situations. I saw a different paradigm when I left air medical flying in the States and worked with the Royal Oman Police. We flew with two crew, we were instrument rated, current, and proficient. We got plenty of training. We had all the bells and whistles in the aircraft to autopilot, everything safe. A large contrast to most American EMS pilots. Flying without the proper equipment has killed more aviators than bullets ever have. Because you just lose it. And really experienced pilots with a lot of flight time have died 
by inadvertently going into a cloud and not having an autopilot to help them out or a second pilot to help them out. But of course, you put a second pilot in there, now you're talking about you gotta get a bigger helicopter, it's gonna cost more money, you have to have two engines instead of one to get, have the oomph to get you off the ground. Okay, so it's all about money. Most of the programs in America flying air medical would not be allowed to operate outside our borders because they wouldn't come up to the same criteria that they need in Canada, that they need in Europe. You might think the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, would have regulations to ensure pilot safety. But believe it or not, the FAA falls incredibly short because of one fundamental problem. The FAA, I don't have a lot of time for the FAA. There's a lot of good people working for them, but they're overworked and they've got a schizophrenic mandate. They, can, they have to both promote air uh, commerce and regulate it. It's a conflict because they don't want to make laws that are going to put people out of business. So what they do is they come up with recommendations and they go to the operators and they say, what do you think? And they say, well, we can't afford to put autopilots in our helicopters. It'll, it'll put, put many of us out of business. So the FAA doesn't mandate it. And um, that is one of the major problems and why there's so many accidents. They know what the solution is, but it will cost too much. Whereas if it happened in Europe, if it happens in Canada, we, if, you don't, if you can't afford to get in the game, you don't get in the game. Because human life is more important than the bottom line. 2008 was the worst year on record for losing air medical folks, 27. They called a task force. The FAA said, we've got to find out how to stop these accidents because we're losing about 13 people a year in air medical. Seven months later, head of the FAA and uh, head of the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, they said, from 2000 to 2008, had there been an autopilot or a second pilot? Out of the 123 people that died, 60 people would probably still be here today. Although at the time, Randy was far from the problem working for Abu Dhabi Aviation in the United Arab Emirates, the deaths of American EMS pilots were hitting close to home. If the FAA is not gonna mandate that they put in the proper equipment to keep everybody alive in the air medical side, and there was a study, 94% of the crashes in air medical has been due to human error. So it's avoidable, but they have to know what the human foibles are and the human factors are to keep them out of trouble. And I've got the answer. So in January, 2013, I quit my job at Abu Dhabi Aviation to come to America to teach crew resource management to air medical programs to keep everybody alive. If they're not going to be given the tools to keep them alive by the FAA, let's work on the mental stuff to keep everybody coming home safely. So I thought, how about if I train people to my standard? I spent two months, nine hours a day, seven days a week, building a train the trainer course based on the AASA model, the European Aviation Safety Agency model. So it's basically training these guys to airline pilot standards, but in the helicopter. And it's a 300 page manual and, and over five gig flash drive with all the PowerPoint presentations with embedded clips. All that sounds great, but in the absence of better equipment, what are the pilots supposed to do? Easy. I teach them how to say no. I teach them I'm not gonna do this. I teach them that they can identify a hazardous attitude. I teach them that they can identify a link in an error chain forming. I teach them the human factors that can cause them to make a d bad decision and they can all look after each other and say, wait a minute, this is nuts. When somebody in the crew says this is stupid, you go home. So if I can teach them the human factors 
that can cause them to make mistakes. Then many lives, the lives of those rescuing lives, can be saved. For the Founders Series on Our American Stories, I'm Doug Ryder. And thanks so much to Doug Ryder, and Doug is the force behind our Founders Series here on Our American Stories. And thanks to Joey for giving a helping hand on the production and putting these pieces together, as he always does. And thanks to Randy Maines for telling the story. And by the way, if you have a Founders story from your community or just someone you know, send them to us at ouramericannetwork.org. And it does not have to be simply a founder of a business. As you heard here, this is a guy who founded a movement, a safety movement, an important one for people in the field he understands and is an expert in. And by the way, it can be founders of a church, it can be founders of a nonprofit, founders of businesses, sports, franchises, whatever. Send them to ouramericannetwork.org. And my goodness, I never really thought about it before, that idea that, man, a hospital would just say, go get to the accident and not really chart a path and not really look at the weather patterns. And my goodness, it's so true what can happen once you're in those clouds. I have friends who fly, and I've been up there a couple of times when you get in the clouds. And let me tell you, when you're with people who aren't instrument rated, it's scary. And I don't do it anymore. I mean, I did before, but I don't do it anymore. As good as they say they are, even when they're instrument rated, even when they have the experience, I'm getting on a nice old commercial plane. Brandy Maines' story here on Our American Stories, Our Founders Series.